And I'm happy to say that Lido Pimienta joins me now from her home. Hi, Lido. How are you? Hello, everybody. Hi. Are you are you able to be creative at a time like this? Um, I am always creative, and the isolation only just gives more fire. You see, just 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 gives me more more time to create. I have a lot of ideas and things that I've been pushing and putting off that now I can enter. You know, um. We can't go on tour, we can't, you know, play live, you know, I just put out the record, but I'm trying to take all that frustration and put it into my, my artwork, which is very important to me. Um, like right now I'm creating a, um, a limited edition vinyl jacket, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing a series of a hundred and I'm painting those and uh, that's keeping me, you know, connected to my audience and, um, uh, all kinds of stuff. I'm always painting, I'm writing, and uh, yeah, just gotta do the best. <laughs> Is that one of your paintings there behind you right now? Oh, mm -hmm. yeah, actually. It's so that's the vinyl. It's the shiny vinyl and some of the CD. It's a little different. It's really beautiful. Um, we took this photo in Colombia, and then I'm working on this painting that I'm actually thinking about doing a live auction as I paint it and, and do more because it's not finished yet, the big painting, because there's all these musicians and elder musicians in Colombia that are in desperate need of support. So I'm doing that. And these are some of the, I'm doing it, I'm, I'm writing, I'm writing my name on all of them right now, but these are some of my, um, the vinyl jackets. <laughs> Check it out. Oh, that's so cool. <laughs> yeah, you know, Lido Pimienta for the masses, baby. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what I do, you know, after the kids go to sleep. And then during the day, I photograph them and then I ship them to Ottawa, where our management is. Shout out to Kilt Management. So it's a lot. I mean... A hundred? When I was like, oh, I should do a hundred. It's not a lot. And now it's like, wow, it seems like I'm doing a thousand. But because I don't know <laughs> how to, I don't know how to make things like simple. I don't, I, I don't know how to be basic and simple. So I like to just add more and more and make it more beautiful. And I really appreciate people, you know, supporting me. So I just want to give people something extra beautiful. Hmm. It, it is a really beautiful record. I was. I'm really kind of bowled away by it and I've listened to it a bunch of times. Did, were you able to isolate yourself from any kind of pressure that would have been associated with winning the Polaris for the last record? Oh yeah. I don't think about any awards. I don't think about streamings and the, the all these people are listening. I don't know. Been buying. I, I don't listen to any of that because I feel like once I start focusing on um, awards and, and numbers, you know, I, I will lose what makes me, me, you know, um, the only thing that I care about is, you know, this, the, 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 the awards and the, and, and the things like if, if it means that I can continue to be myself and if I can continue to, to make the art that I want to make. So I, 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 that's, that's the thing that I'm, that I'm worried about. And, um, I'm not an award, you know, I am, I am, a, I'm, a, I'm an artist. That's it. When you went in to make this record, did you have, did you have a desire in mind? Was it completely generative? Like, I'm just going to sit down and see what comes out. Or was your goal to make something groovier, uh, something more danceable, something more political? Like, was there, was there something you had in mind for this record? I didn't really have a, a, a specific agenda for the album in terms of rhythm or anything it honestly it, it all started in 2015 that's when I started writing it um when 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 Steve Harvey messed up the coronation of Miss Universe um, tell, tell, tell us that whole story for people who don't remember it yeah yeah so 2015 Miss Universe um for those of you who aren't familiar there is a contest where all these women 
are being judged and they willfully go to be judged on their beauty, uh, external mainly. Um, and even though they're all from earth, it's called Miss Universe, that's another conversation. So anyways, the runner ups were Miss Columbia and Miss Philippines. And that year, Steve Harvey's big debut uh, as the host, um, he messed up. He didn't know how, he didn't know that runner up was runner up and he announced the runner up Miss Columbia as Miss Universe. So they give her her crown, she's crying, she's waving at her adoring fans only to tell her that he made a mistake. They take the crown away, give it to Miss Philippines. And, you know, as someone who grew up watching Miss Universe, Miss Columbia, like all of the beauty pages because they're really popular in South America, to me it was hilarious. You know, I was living in Canada at the time and somebody like me who's short, who isn't super skinny, you know, um, those were, you know, the standards of beauty that like I would never meet, you know, and um but it's also a tradition, so there's also something morbid about it that you still you, you still want to watch. And I and I would see the reaction, you know, of Colombians, and it, it was almost as if war was declared from the U.S. to Colombia, and people were being extremely disrespectful and racist towards both Steve Harvey and Miss Philippines, saying that you know, like our our beauty was was better because are the representative of that year, you know, like she's more Western looking. And of course, Steve Harvey, he's black. So he's like all kinds of N-word, this banana eating monkey, this and that. Like it was very, it was like a rude awakening because I had been in Canada at that point for five years. And I had this idea in my head that, you know, Colombia is this perfect, beautiful country. And it's something that us immigrants do a lot. We tend to romanticize where we're from. Right. So I was just like, wow, am I, am I still Colombian if I'm not sharing this, you know, accident and this funny thing that happened on national or international television as a tragedy? I didn't see it as a tragedy. I didn't see, I thought it was funny, but for Colombians um, from Colombia and the Colombian diaspora, when we're Colombians and we come from this country that is extremely problematic we it, we're in constant pro political turmoil to be upset about such a vapid little tiny speck of a nothing um when we have children that are dying because we have no access to water um it, it was very disturbing to me it, it moved me it shook me and i started writing these poems as a response to that but also it made me think about like, who am I and my memories? Are my memories, have they been romanticized? Or is that what really happened? You know, am I Canadian? Am I more Canadian now or am I Colombian? So all of those questions became the cynical love letters to Colombia, to my new home, to myself. And then there we have it, Miss Colombia. What did you start to learn about the way you thought about these things through the writing of it. I think what I find interesting about poetry and about songwriting is that it can kind of crystallize stuff you don't even know that you're thinking. So if you if you start writing poetry and, and art as an exploration of what you're going through after seeing this and after sort of trying to figure out your identity uh, within Canada, even within Colombia, did you, did you start to get any answers? There's still a lot that hasn't been answered mainly because most of the questions that I have are emotional. And there's, there's, it's very difficult to respond to a question that is purely based on feelings because most of those feelings depend on memory, right? So it, depending on who I'm talking to in my family, I will get a certain answer about the same exact thing or memory that I have. Um, but in general, you know, um, because I don't get to, I don't get to travel as much or I do, I, I travel a lot. I go to Colombia often, but when I go, I go for work. 
I go to to create, I go to to record or to film. I'm not there as a regular citizen. So when I try to be a regular citizen, I'm strange. I I I I, I don't recognize myself and because of that it's it, there's a lot of questions that I have yet to to answer. Maybe I'm going to have to move there for a couple of months and not have a work agenda. Just just go and and live as a as a Colombian and bring my children and and, and my my husband with me and and we'll see what happens and maybe some answers will finally arrive. Yeah. It's it's a really beautiful record and what I was trying to say earlier was that I found myself listening to it in my kitchen and kind of dancing and also looking into what the songs were about and really, you know, understanding these questions and starting to grapple with these questions that you were asking in the, in these songs and some of the issues you were bringing up in these songs. I think that's a really powerful thing that that's really challenging to do is to is to make people think and kind of dance at the same time, you know? Yeah, I mean to me, the dancing, it, it, it's funny because, because in North America or to the Western world, you know, dance is associated with happiness. But um, in Colombia or like all the heritage that I have, a lot of the dancing that we do, you do at funerals or you do in ceremony and ceremony for so, someone's passing or, you know, a, cer a ceremony where you celebrate the life of someone that is no longer with us. Like there, there's, there's this, there's this attachment to, to death and longing and letting go. So I think that's just intrinsic in me in the way that I grew up. Um, but also because the things that I sing about are very, are, are more on the serious side and more on the metaphysical, dramatic, melodramatic it's important that I balance that with some, you know, rhythm and, and, and dancing, you know, and I was very lucky because, you know, my co-creator, co-producer, uh, Matt Smith, also known as Prince Nifty, um, you know, I, for years, like since I moved to, to, to Canada, when I heard his stuff online, I, I always knew I have to, I have to work with this guy. Like one day it's going to happen because I knew that I couldn't just have, like the traditional stuff, like we, we needed that that perfect mix of the electronic and the traditional um, and the analog. So it, it, it when you listen to the record, it, it, it's very easy, you know, like you can, we're talking about the breakup, not, not a breakup from, you know, a romantic breakup between two human beings. I'm talking about the breakup between a human being and a whole nation, right? So it's very heavy. It's very, it's very hard. So yeah we got to dance a little bit because I also don't want to cry <laughs> when I, when I'm singing and <laughs> performing live. Well, it's been, it's been lovely to talk to you before we go. Can you tell us about this um, GoFundMe and this um, work you're doing to support elderly Colombian musicians at this time? I just saw it on your Twitter. Yes. So um, one of the groups that are featured in Miss Colombia are called El Sexito Tabala. And there's this legendary uh, Cuban sextet based in um, Palenque de San Basilio, which is the first free town from slavery in all of the Americas. But because it is 99.9% .9 African, black, poor, um, and Colombia doesn't, I mean, we have the infrastructure, we just don't implement it because of the high levels of corruptions. Actually, number one in the world. <laughs> Um, a lot of these elders in traditional Afro-Colombian music and also in the north coast of Colombia, the, like bordering Venezuela, all of these elderly musicians, they don't have a pension. And because of isolation, it's hard for them to, you know, be outside and grow their food like they're used to or go and buy milk and all this stuff. So I'm, I created this fund so that we can, you know, every, every two weeks or every month, we, we send them um, the funds so that they can buy food. So I have all my cousins, um, you know, born in the early 2000s that are driving now. They can go all the way and drop off the groceries. So that's what I'm, that's what I'm doing. Well, that's, that's beautiful. Lido, thanks for your time. You're going to perform a song. What's it going to be? 
Um, the song is called Coming Through. Um, and it's the only thing that I say in English. <laughs> That's as far as I got <laughs> writing a song in English. Um, but it, yeah, it's a song about, about coming through. It's a song about showing up for yourself. Um, and yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change my, my crown. By the way, these are made by my mother. Soon I'm going to put them online so you can, so you can buy them. So that she doesn't have to oh, go beautiful. to work ever again. Oh yeah, my mom is super talented. I mean, indigenous people, <laughs> we're good at craft. This is all I'm trying to say. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, enjoy the song and um, have a good day and stay home. Stay home. Just stay home. Stay home. Later, nice to talk to you. Take care. Bye-bye.